The next data structure that we're going to look at is a resizable array. In C++, this is implemented in the standard library as a vector, which is probably the data structure that you're going to use most often. Let's look at what a resizable array can do and how we might implement it under the hood. The drawback of a fixed size array is that we have to specify how many elements we want to store at the time the array is created. There are situations where you might not know this, for example, if we're reading data in from a file. In a resizable array, we can keep adding elements at will, up to the memory lim limits of the computer. We can access and modify elements in the same way as a fixed size array, by their index. So here's the ADT for a resizable array. We call it vector after the name of the C++ implementation in the standard library. So we have a function pushback, uh, which takes an argument x, and that adds x to the end of the resizable array. So now we can push back as many times as we want, up to the memory limits of the computer. We also have a function popback, which removes the last element of the array. We have a function size, which tells us how many elements are currently being stored in the array. And then we have the set and get functions, which work just like in the case of a fixed size array. So note that here, i, the, the argument i given to get or set, must be an integer uh, between 0 and strictly less than the size of the array. If you call these functions with an index outside this range, this results in undefined be behavior. Now let's see how we can design a data structure that implements the resizable array abstract data type. We are going to implement resizable arrays using fixed size arrays. So here's the basic idea. We start out with a fixed size array. The size of the array is the capacity. It's important to distinguish the capacity from the actual number of elements we are storing. So the actual number of elements we are storing, we call the size. As long as the capacity is larger than the size, we have room to push back more elements in our fixed size array. We push back an element into the leftmost available slot. And since we're using a fixed size array here, we can implement get and set just from the analogous operations on the fixed size array. So you see in this example here, we're actually storing five elements. So the size is five, but we have a fixed size array which is larger than five, so we have some slots which aren't being used. And those extra slots we, saw, we call the excess capacity. As long as there's excess capacity, we can keep pushing back elements into this fixed size array that we're using behind the scenes to implement our resizable array. So let's go into a little bit more detail how this works. We can maintain a pointer called begin to the start of the fixed size array and a pointer called end to one past the last element stored in the array. So this end pointer is pointing to the location where we should push back the next element. And from begin and end, we can determine the size, the number of elements in the array. So this is how a resizable array works in its normal mode of operation when we have excess capacity. Let's go over the complexity of all the operations in this normal mode of operation. So while there is excess capacity, we can push back an element in constant time. Now let's see what happens in the more interesting case when there is no excess capacity. So say that our fixed size array is full, and we want to push back another element. What can we do in this situation? 
So we're like a hermit crab that has grown too large for its shell. We need to find a new and bigger shell to store our elements. So what we can do is we allocate a new, larger array. This takes constant time by rule two of our operations in our model, of, in our computational model. So after we allocate this new and larger array, we copy all the elements into their new home. We copy all the elements over into this new larger array. And once we've done that, then we can free the memory of the original array. You can see that this is an expensive operation because we have to copy all the elements into the new array. The other things we have to do, like allocate memory for the new array and free the memory of the old array, just take constant time. So the main work is actually in this operation of copying all the elements into the new array. And this is going to take time proportional to the capacity of the old array. So now we have a decision to make. How should we choose the size of the new array? We could always choose the size of the new array to be just one larger than the old one. Then we are never wasting any space. But this would be terribly expensive in terms of time because every time we push back, we would have to copy all the elements over. On the other hand, we could choose a very, very large new array. We could just, right at the beginning, allocate uh, as much memory as our computer has for our resizable array. This means that we could do many pushback operations before we run out of excess capacity, and all these pushback operations will be fast. But on the other hand, if we don't actually do that many pushbacks, we have allocated a lot of memory that's not being used, and we might need that memory for other things. So thus we have this trade-off between time and memory. So a common solution to this trade-off is to choose the size of the new array to be twice the size of the old one. This solution is called array doubling, and is typically what is done in the implementation of a C++ vector. In this way, we use at most twice as much memory as we need. And we can also show that this choice is reasonably good in terms of time complexity. So it takes a little bit of analysis to, to see why. So let's do that now. The main work in growing from a smaller array to a larger one is copying all the original elements into the new array. All the other operations, like allocating the new array and freeing the old one, just take constant time. So we're going to count the number of copy operations as a proxy for time. So let's look at the number of copy operations as we do a sequence of pushbacks. Specifically, here we're going to push back five elements. So let's suppose that we start out when the fixed array just has size one. Okay, so that's when we do our first pushback. Say we push back five. There is excess capacity, and we don't have to make any copies. Okay, so in blue here I've noted zero copies. Now let us push back eight. So in this case there's no excess capacity. So we allocate a new array of twice the size, so of size two. Okay, so then we have to copy five into the new array and also insert eight. So I'm going to call that one copy op operation because we just have to copy over five. I mean, we could or we could not include eight as well. Um, I'm just, I'm not including eight. It's going to make the counting a little bit prettier. Okay, so we call this one copy operation. Okay, so this is the state we're in. We have our fixed size array of size two and it has the elements five and eight in it and there's currently no capacity. So for the next pushback, say we want to push back zero, we again need to allocate a new array. We're going to allocate a new array of twice the size, so a new array of size four. And then we have to copy five and eight over to the new array and also insert zero, this la latest element that we push back. So in this case, we had to make two copies. 
Okay, now we push back 11. This is an easy case, the normal mode of operation. There's excess capacity, so we don't have to make any copies. Okay, so last example, let us push back 22. Again, there's no excess capacity, so we have to allocate a new array. We allocate a new array of size 8, and we have to copy over the four elements from the old array. So we have to do four copy operations. Okay, so I think from this example, now we should be able to see the general pattern of what is happening. So with array doubling, starting from array of size 1, the size of the array is always going to be a power of 2, right? When we start at size 1, we double, it'll be 2, double again, 4, 8, 16, etc. The size of the array is always going to be a power of 2. So this means that when we insert element number 2 to the i plus 1 for some i, that's when we're going to have to that's when we're going to have no excess capacity to handle the pushback and we're going to have to allocate a new uh, array and the number of copy operations that we're going to have to do in that case is the number of elements that were in the old array which is 2 to the i okay so when we go to pushback for the 2 to the i plus 1 time we're going to have to do 2 to the i copy operations into the new array. Thus, if we insert 2 to the k plus 1 elements overall, the total number of copy operations that we have to do is given by this formula here. So for every power of 2 up to 2 to the k, we're going to have to copy over that many elements at some point. right? So we have the sum from i equals 0 to k of 2 to the i. And this sum is equal to 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. So that's the number of copy operations that we have to do. So we see that the number of copy operations is actually less than twice the total number of pushback operations. Right, The number of pushback operations was 2 to the k plus 1. So in general, the time to push back n elements will be at most a constant times n. So this means that the average time to do a pushback when averaged over the total number of pushback operations is constant. So in summary, the time to do a pushback can vary. When there is excess capacity, it is very fast. It's just constant time. But when there is no excess capacity, it is slow because we have to copy all the elements from the old array into the new array. But in the array doubling solution, the moments where we have to do all this copying are sufficiently spaced out that the total time to do n pushbacks is just a constant times n. The term for this kind of analysis, where we look at the time for an operation, where, where the time for an operation can vary, and we look at the average time of the operation over a sequence of operations, is called amortized analysis. So in this case, we say that the amortized time complexity of pushback is constant. Again, amortized just means averaged over a sequence of operations. When we're analyzing an algorithm that, that does n pushbacks, we know that the total time this can contribute is at most a constant times n. But just be aware that sometimes a single pushback can take, can be slow, right? It can take time proportional to the size, the number of elements in the, in the array. In the standard library, a standard vector is an implementation of the resizable array abstract data type. So here are some of the operations of the abstract data type. And this is taken from cppreference.com, which is a great resource for data structures in the standard library. So you see it has operations that we talked about, um, the size function, pushback, popback, Okay, and what I want to show you is that 
Then if you were to go to this website and click on pushback, then it tells you more information about the, the pushback member function. And what I wanted to show you here was actually, see at the bottom, it says complexity. And see that it says amortize constant, right? Which is what we just talked about. So any implementation of vector in the standard library, it must satisfy this constraint that pushback should be an amortized constant operation. So in particular, you know, it's allowable to do array doubling, uh, like we talked about. And indeed, that is how most implementations of vector in the standard library work. They use array doubling. So I want to mention that it is possible to implement a resizable array where pushback always takes at most constant time. So in this case, we say that it takes constant time in the worst case rather than amortize constant time. So you can read details about how to do, how to do that in this paper called Resizable Arrays in Optimal Time and Space. The, the basic idea in this paper is called background rebuilding. And basically what that means is that rather than copy all the elements into the new array all at once so that this one pushback takes a lot of time, we just copy a few elements each time we do a pushback. So we basically simultaneously maintain the old vector and the new vector, and we just copy over a few elements at a time. So this way we spread out the complexity of the copying operations over many pushbacks rather than doing it all at once. So this background rebuilding is quite a common trick to convert an amortized time bound into a worst case time bound. However, the C++ standard does not require worst case constant time for pushback. It allows these amortized constant time solutions. What do you think? Is that a good decision? Which implementation would you rather have?